But we're in week two in this series through the, through the whole Bible. It's called The Story. It's the chronological walk through the Bible. It's going to take nine months, and it's going to be wonderful. Today is week two. We still have copies of The Story. It's got 31 chapters, and it's, it's just uh, the Old Testament in the New International Version arranged chronologically. And, of course, we don't cover every verse. We don't cover every chapter because there's 66 books, and this is only 31 chapters. But it's going to be a great journey today. Today I want to tell three stories from the lives of Abraham and Sarah from the book of Genesis. Uh, The key word is faith. Story number one, and these all occurred about 4,000 years ago. Story number one I've titled, Go. In Genesis 11, at the end of the chapter, it says that Abram's father, Terah, Abram and Sarai, his wife, and Abram's nephew Lot, that the four of them, led by Terah, left Ur, which is modern-day Iraq, and they traveled up to Haran, which is modern-day Turkey, with the goal of then moving down into Canaan. We don't know why Terah, Abram's father, decided to move. We don't know why he didn't just cut straight across from Ur to Canaan, if that was his final destination, which it was. And we don't know why when they got up to Haran, they stopped, but they did. And it appears that they stayed there 5, 10, 15 years, 20 years, they, they, they settled in Haran. That brings us to chapter 12 of Genesis, verse 1, and it says this. The Lord said to Abram, Go out from your land, this is Haran, okay, your relatives and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who treat you with contempt. And all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. He took all his possessions and the people he had acquired in Haran. Remember, he likely had been living there 5, 10, 15, 20 years, okay? And they set out for the land of Canaan. We don't know how God spoke to Abram when he said, go. Was it an audible voice? Was it a dream? Was it just that mystical, I just feel like God's told me, okay? We don't know how, but God told Abraham, I want you to go to Canaan, and I'm making a promise that you're going to have, uh, your descendants will become a great nation. Now, it's a big enough deal to just show up on someone's doorstep and say, move, It's a bigger deal for Abram and Sarai because she was infertile. At the end of chapter 11, it says she could have no children. She was infertile. And so this idea that, number one, they were just to pack up and leave. He didn't know why. And number two, they were going to become a great nation, but they couldn't have any kids. They had already figured that out. So it looks almost matter of fact where in verse 4 it simply says, So Abram went. Like, so he went to the grocery store. I mean, it was like a little thing. It doesn't sound big. And yet, this is huge for Abram, for him to go. Not only just because God told him, but I want you to to consider this. Abram wasn't a follower of God when God told him to follow So hundreds of years later, Joshua was a great leader of Israel, and he was recounting this story from Genesis 12. And he told the Israelites, long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham, worshipped other gods. Now, scholars aren't for sure on this. But there's certainly no evidence that prior to Genesis 12, when God showed up to Abraham and said, go, that Abraham followed God. In all likelihood, he was worshiping other gods. And so there were several things stacked against him when it comes to his faith. One, could he trust a God that was brand new to him? What about the infertility of of his wife? 
You see, we call this blind faith. I'm using two phrases, blind faith and reasonable faith. Blind faith is where there's not a shred of objective evidence or support for why you ought to do something. Blind faith is literally a leap into the dark with nothing to support you. So blind faith, an example would be if you've never seen an airplane, you've obviously never been in an airplane, but someone straps a parachute on your back, you've never seen a a skydiver, you're up there and someone tells you at 10,000 feet, okay, jump, and that little red cord, if you pull that, you'll be okay. That's blind faith because there's not a shred of, of track record or experience or anything for why you would believe that. Reasonable faith would be if you were an experienced skydiver and you had actually checked the company and that, that company had a, a reasonably good health record, safety record, you know, that was leading this whole thing. Then it still takes faith, but it's reasonable. All of you drove to church this morning with reasonable faith. It was reasonable because you assumed everyone would stop at the stoplights and stay on the right side of the road. But it still took faith. It's reasonable. So there's blind faith, which is the leap into the dark. And then there's reasonable faith. What, what Abraham did here, it's blind faith. Okay? Story number two. I've titled this one, Childless. Abram was 75 years old and Sarai was 65 when God made the promise that he would give them a child and make a great nation. Um, Back then, the 75 and the 65 weren't the big issues. They lived longer. It was the infertility issue. So for the next 10 years, they tried to have children. And many of you have either tried to have children or you've known people who have tried to have children. People who so desperately want a family, but it doesn't work. Today, there are medical opportunities and in vitro and whatnot. But back then, all they had was a promise from God that he would build a great nation out of Abraham's seed. So for 10 years, they tried. At some point, Sarai, I can't blame her, begin to walk through that door of discouragement and doubt and whatever level of faith, reasonable or blind, that she had 10 years ago, well, it wasn't there now. So we come to Genesis 16. It starts out this way. Abram's wife, Sarai, had not borne any children for him, but she owned an Egyptian slave named Hagar. Sarai said to Abraham... Abram, since the Lord has prevented me from bearing children, go to my slave. (laughs) Perhaps through her I can build a family. For lack of a better word, this is a surrogate mother. Okay? And Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So, it's interesting that Sarai is blaming God now. God's the one who told her that she would have a child, and now she's saying, well, we've tried for 10 years, and God's preventing it. So the story continues. So Abram's wife, this is more in Genesis chapter 16, verse 3 to 5. So Abram's wife, Sarai, took Hagar and gave her to her husband, Abram. This happened after Abram had lived in the land of Canaan for 10 years. He slept with Hagar, and she became pregnant. When Hagar became pregnant, she treated Sarai with contempt. Then Sarai said to Abraham, you are responsible for my suffering. I put Hagar in your arms, and ever since she saw that she was pregnant, she has treated me with contempt. Now, a little, just a a reflection on this whole, like, drama that's going on right here. This is not an adulterous affair in the sense that Abram's sneaking behind, you know, Sarai's back. I mean... In that culture, Sarai said, okay, God said we have a child. He's preventing me from having a child, so I'm going to take matters into my own hands. We're going to get this surrogate mother. That child will be my child. And so here, instead of the in vitro thing, it's you sleep with her. 
So it was wrong, it was sin, but it wasn't in the sense of a, an adulterous affair where he was going behind her back. But when, he, when Hagar got pregnant, she started to like mock or make fun of or smile or, you know, look at this, you know. Something happened where this servant girl now felt above her master, Sarai. And so Sarai comes and says, this is all your fault. And Abraham's thinking, well, didn't you hand her over to me? You know, a little bit of drama, and I'll just insert this here. Um, Abram and Sarah did not always have a good marriage. They were not always functional people. Uh, there is no such thing as a perfectly healthy and functional family. I'll just say it right now. All of you look really healthy and functional right now, but I know you're not. I'm not. We all have higher levels of dysfunction and conflict and bad decisions and things we'd be embarrassed to tell in front of this group of people about our family. We all have yelling bouts or anger bouts or stuff that's just huge in our past. And, and Abram and Sarah were normal like that. In this run through the life of Abram and Sarah that I'm doing this morning, I'm leaving out significant patches of his story where he showed tremendous disrespect toward his wife. He had a chronic issue with lying and deceit. This man, Abram and Sarah, they did not like have their life together. And here they're fighting over this child thing and this surrogate and everyone's mad at everyone. Just so you know, everyone is dysfunctional. Now, let's keep going. Genesis 17, when Abram was 99 years old, God appears to him again and says, I will keep my word, and you will be the father of a great nation. He changed Abram and Sarai's name as kind of the anchor point for that conversation. He changed Abram to Abraham, which now means father of nations, and from Sarai to Sarah, which means ruling princess, okay? But he gave him new names and renewed his promise, and right after that, three visitors showed up on Abraham's doorstep. Uh, a lot of debate over who these three visitors were, but they were strangers. They came to Abram, and they said, by this time next year, you will have a son. You see, up until now, it's been up close to 25 years, 24 years, and God has always said, hang in there, hang in there, hang in there. I'll give you a, a son. But this is the first time a calendar is attached to it. Now these three come and say, within a year, you're going to have your son, and you ought to name him Isaac. Now when Sarah heard this, it was pretty, it's a pretty sad reaction, but it's also pretty funny. So uh, in, in Genesis chapter 18, uh, it says, Abraham and Sarah were old and getting on in years. Sarah had now passed the age of childbearing. So when the visitors told them that they would have a child within a year, she laughed to herself and said, after I have become shriveled up and my Lord is old, will I have this delight? I mean, I'm just telling you, we're all going to turn into just like shriveled oranges, okay? It's just what happens, and I think it's kind of funny. It's sad because she really doesn't believe it, but she says, I'm just a shriveled up old woman, and I'm going to have this delight of delivering a son? Chapter 21, the Lord came to Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age. At the appointed time, God had told him, Abraham named his son Isaac. It took almost 25 years, but God did deliver on his promise, and Sarah did deliver a son, out of whom a nation would one day come. Story number three, the altar. When Isaac was 15 years old, so it's 40 years have passed since the call in Genesis 12. It's been 40 years since God said, go and I'll make a great nation. Genesis 22. After these things, God tested Abram and said to him, Abraham, here I am, he answered. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering 
on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Now when it says, take your son, your only son Isaac, your son whom you love, he knew there was this Ishmael who was born through Hagar, but that was not the son through whom the nation would be built. So God was saying, take your only son, the one through whom I'll build my nation, and I want you to kill him. Now this is an absurd thing. It is completely out of the character of God. Nowhere else in Scripture does God come close to like telling someone, go kill your kid. It's absurd. But what we know that Abraham didn't was that this was a test. All along, God wasn't planning and hoping that Abraham would do it. He was testing Abraham's faith. But it appeared absurd. It's, it's, it's outside of who God is. But of all things, Abraham simply said, okay. Just like 40 years ago, when this new God appeared to him and said, go, I'll make you into a great nation. He said, okay. And now 40 years later, God says, now take that son that's now 15. That's the one whom the nation's going to come, and I want you to kill him. Okay. Genesis uh, chapter 22, I want to read some verses, beginning with verse 3. So Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took with him two of his young men, young men and his son Isaac. He split wood for the burnt offering and set out to go to the place God had told him about. On the third day, okay, it was a three-day journey to get to this Mount Moriah, on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in a distance. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. Listen carefully. The boy and I will go over there to worship, and then we will come back. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on the back of his son Isaac. In Abraham's hand, he took the fire and the sacrificial knife, and the two of them walked on together. It's at this point that Isaac, this 15-year-old, carrying this wood for the burnt offering on his shoulders, his dad carrying the knife and the fire, and there's debate over you know, sticks or whatever that he was going to start the fire with. Hey, Dad... Yes, son. So we got the wood, and we got the, the knife and the fire. Where's the lamb for the, for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb, my son. And the two of them walked on together. When they arrived at the place that God had told him about... Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood. He took it off his son's back. It had been tied on there. and He arranged it on the, the stone or the ground. He bound his son Isaac. Now you tell me how that happened. I mean, it's like, come here, son. Trust me. I mean, what did he say? He, he bound his son Isaac and placed him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out and took the knife to slaughter his son. I think, did he look away? I mean, did, crying? I mean, what was it like? Abraham reached out and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham replied, here I am. Then the angel said, don't lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you passed the test. He says this, now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your only son from me. Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. 
So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering in place of his son. What happened between him and his son when he untied his son? And he offered the the ram as a burnt offering in place of his son. So through the years, artists have used their imagination to, uh, you can go to the next slide. They've used their imagination to try to portray what it was like. You know, a, a son tied up, a knife raised, an angel saying, wait, wait, don't do it. A ram caught in the thicket. You know, the stunning thing is that when Abram left his two servants, his two men with the donkey, he said, Isaac and I will go and we will come back. He actually believed that God could raise his son from the dead. In Hebrews chapter 11, it lists great men and women of the faith. And uh, in chapter 11, verse 17 and 18, it recounts this story. It says, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. He considered God to be able even to raise someone from the dead. This, my friends, is faith. So, back to the picture. And, you know, it's, uh, there's, this, uh, there's this word that theologians use. It's, it's foreshadowing. Foreshadowing. Uh, a shadow normally is a light, and my shadow's behind me right here. The light's coming this way, and the shadow's behind me. To foreshadow is really to, to point to the future instead of to point behind you. And so... Theologians talk about events in the Old Testament that foreshadow Jesus. So I don't know if there's significant to the fact, significance to the fact that it took three days' journey to get to Moriah. Jesus was buried, killed, killed, and three days later he rose again. But, uh, but Abraham straps some wood on on Isaac's back, the wood on which he would die, and some people threw the cross on Jesus' back, the wood upon which he would die. Uh, He tied Isaac down, it says. Jesus was nailed to the cross. Abraham believed that when he killed his son, he could step back and God himself would seal the wound, fix it, and raise his son to life. Abraham believed that. That's why he said, the two of us are going, we're going to offer the sacrifice, and then we will come back. And Jesus absolutely believed that when the knife plunged into his heart, God would raise him again. It's called foreshadowing. So, what do we take away from this? Oh, the, the biggest takeaway is the question, have you put your faith in the sacrifice of Jesus? Uh, if you hear nothing else today, like that's like the big deal. This is not, not just the big question, question for the morning. It's the big question for life. I mean, and we have different phrases that Christians have used. Have you accepted Jesus as your Savior? Have you invited Jesus into your heart? Have you believed in God or become a Christian? We have these phrases. But at some point, you have to believe that God is real, and his son really lived, and your sin is really real, and it's keeping you out of heaven because you'll just corrupt the place if you go like, you can't even go there with your sin. And so it's this basic but profound gift that God wants to offer to us where he says, if you'll just believe. I think it's a reasonable faith. It's not a blind faith to believe in God. You see, there's plenty of evidence. There's not proof that God exists, but there's a lot of evidence 
There's no proof that Jesus lived, but there's an astounding amount of evidence, even outside of the scriptures, that there was a man, Jesus. He did live where the Bible says. He did die, and he did rise again. You see, it's a reasonable faith to believe in God and to believe in Jesus. It's obviously a reasonable faith to believe that you and I make mistakes and we've got sin. And so this first question is, have you settled your relationship with God by asking him to be your savior? Okay? Another takeaway do you live by faith? I mean, you can't believe in God without faith, and you can't follow God without faith. But do you really, I mean, do you believe? Now, it's an interesting thing, this reasonable and blind faith. For some, for some of you, it's almost blind faith, this huge leap for you to even invite a friend to church that you've never ever in your life had a spiritual conversation with a person who isn't following Christ. And for you, that's not reasonable faith to do what God has told you to do. It's blind faith. For others of you, that's a reasonable faith. I'm not here to, to determine where your line shifts from a reasonable faith, doing what God tells you to do that you can just do, and a blind faith, the big hard things. All I'm saying is that you will rob yourself of life if you try to stay cocooned in your little faith world of reasonable faith. God is going to ask you to step out on some days in blind faith. I mean, the big leap. And the classic story of how that happens is someone who's fully entrenched in their career, they've got a family, and out of the blue, God calls them to be a missionary. That's what you call blind faith. But whatever the example is, do you live by faith? Here's the, the third takeaway that I want to throw your way. Can you believe that God will use you to make a big difference. Remember how I said that Abram and Sarah had a dysfunctional marriage at, on, on certain days. Uh, they were plagued with lots of issues. He was a deceitful man, tremendous disrespect of his wife. Uh, stories I didn't include in this morning's talk. Uh, a, a, a deceitful liar. And yet, again and again through the Bible, God just uses the weak and the broken and the frail and the messed up because you are not a fully healthy and functional person. None of us are. God's only option is to use the broken and the unqualified. And so he used an old couple without the best of marriages. He was a liar. She was just cranky. Blamed everyone for everything. But God used them. An old and infertile couple. You may not recognize these names, but maybe you will. These are men and women from the Bible. Joseph was a slave. Moses stuttered. Gideon was fearful. Samson was proud. Rahab was an immoral prostitute. King David had an affair. The prophet Elijah was suicidal. Jeremiah was depressed. Jonah was disobedient. Naomi was a widow. Mary was this poor teenage girl. John the Baptist was, to say the least, just weird and eccentric. Peter was impulsive. Martha worried a lot. The Samaritan woman had several failed marriages. Thomas had his doubts. Paul was in poor health. Timothy was timid. And it goes on and on. Do not believe the lie of the enemy, the lie of the devil, and, and think that God can't use you. We are his only option. And he is eager to step into the lives of broken, frail, dysfunctional, people without the best marriages, people who can't have kids, people who are, are all messed up in all kinds of ways. And God says, well, well, thank you for admitting that because I'd like to use you. Don't believe for a second that God can't use you. Every day he says, trust me. Some days it'll be reasonable. Some days it'll be blind but it's always worth it, and he will use you. Let me pray, and then we'll wrap things up with the offering and a, a really neat worship song. Father, my first prayer is for those who have never made that step of faith, of commitment to you, and I pray that in their own words, they would say something like this. Father, I believe in you. Jesus, I believe you are real. 
that you died and you were the sacrifice, kind of like Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac. You were sacrificed for my sin, and I ask you to forgive me. I pledge my life to your service. I pray, Father, that people who have never said that kind of a prayer would say it this morning. And for all of us, that we would be people who live by faith and never, ever, ever believe the lie of the devil that you can't use us to change the world because you can. Thank you for being a, a wonderful, merciful Savior. Bless this offering in Jesus' name. Amen.